half in the bag. Fuck movies. You know, Harry, can I call you Harry? You can, because I am. Especially my ass. I've never complimented you on your beautiful eyes. Can you even see my eyes? I'm constantly wearing these sunglasses. Oh, I, I guess I haven't seen your eyes, but I'm sure they're beautiful. I can just picture the color. Fecal matter brown, rose red glaucoma veins, and those dreamy, cloudy cataracts. Uh-huh. I could stare into that nightmare of looming death all day. Uh-huh. You know, I think it's time I told you that I'm into some really weird shit. Sexually. Some really, really weird shit. So one time, I took a fire hose. Well, gentlemen, did we save room for dessert tonight? Mike, what are you doing here? Where's our waiter? Oh, uh, your waiter? Uh, he had to leave. Um, he had a, a family emergency. I'm filling in for the rest of his shift. <laughs> yeah, um, I work here. And this is my shirt and tie. You know, some dessert sounds nice right now. What are your specials today, good sir? Well, sir, today we have white cake, and we have white cake, and lastly, we have a delicious white cake. Hmm. You know, honey, I'm gonna let you decide. That meal we just had didn't sit right with me, so now I'm gonna sit right on the toilet. Meaning, I think shit's gonna come spraying out of my asshole all over the walls, the floor, a little bit in the toilet, but not that much. You see, I'm getting old, and my anus isn't quite what it used to be. Yeah, it's, it's all kind of like loose and spongy. Yeah, yeah, my ass looks like a wet sack of groceries, but oh, you'll find out soon on our wedding night. So if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go finish taking a shit. Sir, have them deliver five fresh wet towels to the men's bathroom. Absolutely, sir. Oh, thank God. Jay, do you mind if I sit down and take a load off? Um, sure. Sit down and, uh, hey, we can talk about movies. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, have you seen that new film Baby Driver, featuring the voices of Alec Baldwin, Steve Buscemi, and Lisa Kudrow? You know, I did. It was a little more violent than I was expecting it to be. You don't mind, do you? Can you, can you top me off? That's beer. Oh. So what is it you do? I'm a driver. Oh, like a chauffeur. Anyone I'd know? I hope not. Baby Driver stars Ansel Elgort. And no, his name is not an anagram, nor is it a Star Wars character. That's his name! Baby Driver is a coming-of-age heist movie with lots of music, action, and angry John Hamm. Let's talk about Baba Dravar, as it's known in France. Jay, um, while I'm sitting and taking a little break, and while Plinkett is in the bathroom having a giant dump, let's talk about Baby Driver. Everyone wants Baby to know what well, we thought of Baby Driver for some reason. I thought this movie was very, very good. I didn't think it was great. People were raving about it. I thought it was really entertaining. I thought the first act or so was like just a, a fantastic piece of visual storytelling and visual filmmaking, and it was really exciting. Uh, I thought the last act was pretty solid and entertaining. I thought it sagged a bit in the middle, uh, and it is sort of a standard kind of heist type story that is elevated by its gimmick. Jay, I'm forced to disagree with you. I thought this was one of the best films I have ever seen. Oh, I also thought it was one of the best films I've ever seen. No, um, I'm on the same page. Really, really, really liked it. I, I feel like it's hard for me to look at it as just a solo movie. Like I'm looking at it in the, you know, kind of filmography of Edgar Wright. And there it's one of the weaker ones. Like it's, it's a solid movie. And I think it's really entertaining and people are gonna like it, but it's lacking that uh, sort of like 
heart that his other movies have had. And I wonder if that's the Simon Pegg elements in the writing of those earlier movies. Possibly, possibly. N nothing reaches, like Shaun of the Dead, goofy zombie comedy movie, but there's that amazing scene when his mom is turned into a zombie and he's like emotionally wrecked. That's what this is about, isn't it? It's just, it just, he doesn't like me. He's always hated me and now he wants to shoot my mom. She's not, you never thought I deserved her, that I was good enough. There's, there's nothing that reaches that in this movie. And I guess it's a different movie. It doesn't have to reach that, but it really uh, kind of keeps the movie from being more, those other movies uh, are like their, their genre kind of, uh, homages that are elevated with like a real human story going on and this one doesn't get above the genre it, that it's representing. It does have to reach that that level though because it establishes it and it and it sets you up for it um, and and it tries to do that with the end you know um, and all that but it yeah you're right it does not it does not become its own thing right at a certain point it, it's really hard to describe because when I said derivative, um, of course, the, the first thing that comes to mind is Drive. There's um, there's that, that feel of Guardians of the Galaxy. I know that's not a wholly original thing, but the whole idea of um, playing the music, the music incorporated with the story, and then the mixtape well, his, with uh, the mom uh, yeah, connection. His, and, his, oh yeah, the mom connection, that's a big one. But yeah, the, apparently Edgar Wright's had this idea for like over yeah. a decade. So. I'm not accusing him of Stealing sure, that. Sure, it's nor, just sort of like... Is it wholly original to where it's like, oh, he's ripping off this or right. that. It's just sort of unfortunate timing that it comes out the same summer as Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which despite the fact that this whole movie is driven by music, um, and it does it well as far as the action scenes go, but despite the fact that it's driven by music, there's no moment where the music uh, kind of trans transforms the scene the way the Fleetwood Mac use in Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. 2 does. And, and that, was, that was kind of a... a larger disappointment for me because everyone kept saying like the music the music and that starts off like uh, I got a little La La Land vibe in the beginning too <laughs> because it starts off with that first heist yeah. that sets up the tone and the, the movie and and he's like kind of he starts singing in the car and then he's playing with the wiper blades and everything's kind of going to the beat and then there's a scene that follows the heist when he's like you know he's on cloud nine and he's you know it's almost done with his uh, business and he's kind of dancing and then you know there's a like, billboard of a guy playing a trumpet and he kind of does the same thing it's and all like, one shot too. one shot it's and, impressive yeah and there's all that where it's this kind of like very playful light-hearted energetic um almost musical style to it oh, and I'm sure. like this this is going to get really good and it's going to ramp up and then all these songs are going to come up and they're going to they're going to match and the editing was great I mean I was very impressed with that but then it becomes a Quentin Tarantino film and and, and boy oh boy was I engaged <laughs> Jamie Foxx is Wonderful in this film. Jamie Foxx is good. John Hamm is great. Mm -hmm. And there's a nice, uh, without getting into spoilers, there's a nice, uh, I don't know if it's a twist, but the, the development of the John Hamm character uh, is good. Yeah, it was the Jamie Foxx show. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, a Ansel Elgort uh, uh, was, and I, was, and I don't know how to put this politely, he did, he did not carry the film well. Like ever, all the criminals in the movie are so like disgusting and old and dirty and, yeah. and talkative and and he's so just like like fresh faced and clean and stuff. Well, that's yeah. I mean, this, the movie's called Baby Driver. I mean, that's the character. And I, I thought he was great in the movie. Actually, I like the the sort of contrast between the scenes with him with the criminals and him outside of that world and how it's like almost like a switch when he when he's with them. He's like stone faced, stays away from them pretty much, other than what he has to communicate when they're planning their jobs. But he also projects like such coolness and such confidence to where it's almost a contradiction. I think that's just him putting up a front for the, for the criminals though. So you're just starting your day or did you just get off? They call, I go, you know. The weakest part of the movie, though, is the romance between him and, um, I think her name is Lily James? Um, that was shockingly underwritten. I was really surprised by that. Uh, compare that to any of the relationship stuff in the other, you know, Edgar Wright movies. Well, it has it has sort of like a storybooky kind of old Hollywood quality to it. And where, I don't know if it's intentionally underwritten, like she's the waitress. She's like, yeah. I'm, I'm a girl, I'm a waitress. and. 
I'm just going to be here forever. Like that which, is, which is and, fine. I didn't felt mind. very like retro. Very f- sure, which was fine when it started off. But it, it's, it reaches a point where she kind of has to make a decision uh, whether she wants to go with Baby Driver or, or not. And when she makes that decision, I was like, but why? Like they barely know each other. You can look at it that way or you can look at it as like old Hollywood romance kind of thing. And then that's the thing is like, it felt like a movie that took place in 1950 because you have like two young kids. In 2017, you know, kids would just be staring at their cell phones. She would have helicopter parents that are always calling her on her phone. Um, and then she would be like, I gotta go protest Trump. I gotta go, I gotta go throw this Molotov cocktail at police officers. I have to, I have to go, um, you know, protest Planned Parenthood being defunded by Trump. And you know, and then it's like, it, but it's, it's, it's boiled down to simplicity where she's just a waitress and he says, let's go drive off into the sunset together. Yeah. And we're just gonna head out into the open road. And, and it's so nostalgic. It's so like James Dean kind of. I guess, and so but to, to get you engaged in that story, you need a little more than that though. Yeah, but it's, it's set in a modern day setting, which kind of like, meh, yeah, but, butts maybe it a little. It. But, but if you kind of switch your brain into like a different mode, of, of not fantasy, but r- r- romantic fantasy, I guess. And because that's what this movie was, it was very style over substance. Oh, sure. Like you said, the, the heist plot was not very, um, not very engaging. No. Um, any, anytime there's an action scene going on, anytime baby's behind the wheel, it's incredibly fun though. Yeah. And I don't want to like seem like we're shitting on the movie too much because all that stuff is really great. No, it's, 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 it's a good movie, it, um, but if you're gonna do style over substance, you really need kind of like a really good lead. A Baby Driver as a character, I thought was a little flat. I, I really like Jamie Foxx and John Hamm and their storylines. Yeah. Like, well, Jamie, he, he's overshadowed by everybody else, and that's kind of it's so. kind of hard not to be in a movie like this, where all these these kind of colorful side characters. Then what what is what is the ultimate goal of the movie? Is it is it a love story? I think the goal is Edgar Wright had this idea to do chase scenes that are choreographed and synchronized and edited with music and then worked yeah, but outward. but there weren't that many chase scenes. Well, no, that's like I said, the first half, uh, the first act of the movie I think is pretty strong. There's like mm-hmm, two very. really good sequences. And, and then even the scenes between that I thought were, between the two kind of chase scenes were, were well done. And then the middle is where it's establishing the plot and that's where the movie lags. And then it picks up again at the end. People love great bank robbery stories. So let's give them something bold and brazen as to talk about over their lattes. I was, I was, I always default back to that movie Run Lola Run. I don't know why. <laughs> I think it was because it was like, I've never seen a movie like this before. And you know, and that's a movie where it's like cut to the constant rhythm, constant yeah. rhythm, cut to the music, and it incorporates it really well. This movie, like that first scene, was great, and then they they tease that Queen song, and then I'm like. Yes, you know they're gonna do That's something. That's gonna be the big and then ending. It, then it's like I can't hear it. It's it a, does like, come back at the end, but it doesn't come back in a set. Like I mentioned, the Fleetwood Mac way. music in Guardians of the Galaxy, like that's used perfectly. And this, it's just sort of like, yeah, it's there. Uh, yeah, and and I appreciate the variety of music. Yes. And and it kind of made Guardians of the Galaxy look a little phony in in this movie with this movie's music selections because Guardians of the Galaxy they're doing like the hipster ironic like well, it's it, all the pop 70s songs. pop 70s yeah. Yeah. it makes sense in context because that's what peter quill's mother listened to so that's the type of mixtape she would have made it sure but in this one it's like you know i, th- I thought i saw young mc it's there's, all over the place the beck song deborah from the wonderful album midnight vultures um i was excited to see and this goes for both movies we saw two movies and one of them had an action scene set to the damned and the other had an action scene set to the ramones I was like, man, teenage me would have loved this. Both of these movies. Yeah, but but for some reason, when I when I when I think back in my brain, I can't really remember any of the songs. I might have to do a second pass through. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, Edgar Wright movies uh, definitely benefit from repeat viewings, and mm-hmm. there's, I'm sure, lots of. I noticed early on, he's watching TV and he's flipping through channels, and he passes like Monsters Inc., and that comes into play later on, and so I'm sure there's other things on the TV that 
that hap- that connect to things that happen later in the movie. Yeah. Oh, it's a super clever script and, yeah. and really fun dialogue. The, it felt very Quentin Tarantino-y. Like. Which I was surprised. It wasn't as, as humorous as his other movies. Which it doesn't have to be, of course. He's making a different movie. But I was kind of surprised by that. It really it feels more like yeah, like a Tarantino movie where it's like there, there's humorous elements, but it's not an outright comedy. Yeah. Despite the fact that the entire premise is sort of whimsical. Is uh, it? Contrast. Well, the idea that everything you know matches to the beat of well, this music. Th- that that is whimsical. That the plot, though, isn't like the fact that he has to drive for criminals and stuff. Sure. I mean, I think we're supposed to be kind of seeing it through his his eyes for the I, most I, part. Yeah, so. I get that. I think maybe something less um, something less crime related. Um, might have worked better. I don't know. There's a balance. Like I like that stuff, and I like the incorporation of the music. Um, but then you have that like whole crime subplot, and you know, th- there's that whole sequence when they go to buy guns from with a cameo. I was surprised to see Paul Williams, who nobody has seen in like two decades, but he wrote the music for the Muppet movie. He wrote the Rainbow Connection, and he's in Phantom of the Paradise, and he's a little guy in a white suit in this movie. I was like, hey, it's Paul Williams. Why is he in the movie? He's a music guy. Is Why fr- not? Friends with Ed- Edgar Wright. I, I, it's probably just like Edgar Wright likes him and it's like, hey, come be in my movie. But um, but yeah, there's that whole sequence and which I thought was a great, great scene. So oh. to some random version of tequila that I'd never heard before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but then it's like ultra violent. So I don't know. Doesn't quite, quite sit right with me the whole yeah. movie. Like I was saying, I wonder if that's the, the Simon Pegg, the missing Simon Pegg connection, if he's that part that yeah, those two kind of work so well together. He's like the heart. Yeah. It's missing It's missing that heart. What's he listening to? Oh, let me see. Tequila! Cancel Elgort. <laughs> I'm going to type that into an anagram generator. <laughs> Who the fuck's named Ansel Elgort? See, I liked I liked him. I liked the Lily James. I thought she was incredibly charming. I don't know if I've ever seen her in anything before. I liked the two of them. It was mainly just the way their scenes were written. They were missing that sort of like wit or that, mm-hmm. that heart to them. Yeah, and well, I was incredibly distracted because she looks exactly like uh, Madchen the Meek, the actress that plays Shelly the Waitress on Twin Peaks. And she's a waitress and she's wearing the little waitress outfit. Looks exactly like her. It was really distracting. Another nod was uh, Baby Driver's costume, which looked very reminiscent of Han Solo. Yes, let's he, talk about that. Yeah, he had a white jacket, a jacket with white sleeves and a black, you know, vesty part, and it really looked really looked like looked, Han Solo. Looked like a little Han Solo vest. And uh, I did a little sleuthing. Well, before before that, I was thinking during the movie, I was like, this guy would probably make a good young Han Solo. But then you you researched it and apparently he auditioned for it. Uh, yeah, I was like on a probably a clickbaity site. You know, you have to click next page and oh everything. god, one of those. Yeah, so it's like ten actors that uh, auditioned for Han Solo. So I cannot vouch for its validity. Okay. But um, it said Ansel Elgort auditioned for Han Solo, and I'm like, maybe he really wanted Han Solo, and and he was pissed, and and Edgar Wright <laughs> knew that, and they're like, let me put you in a fucking Han Solo suit, and then I did this. Bling! Holy shit. I looked up Harrison Ford's high school photo and Ansel Elgort, and boy, boy, does he really look like Harrison Ford. Not that he has to look like Harrison Ford, you know, exactly, but I think, I think Ansel Elgort, I think, I think he's got some, he's got something, something that could work. I think performance-wise, he could do a young Han Solo. Yeah. Han Solo. Apparently the person they got sucks shit because they had to hire an acting coach after they shot 95% of the movie. <laughs> can't you wait for that? The young and Han Solo Frankenstein film? I can't wait. Back to Baby Driver, when enough of our Star Wars diversion, the new Han Solo film is a disaster. <laughs> and it's going to be a box office disaster. Someone use this footage later when it makes a billion dollars. Uh, <laughs> put, put a slide whistle next to my fucking face. <laughs> this shit is bananas, dog. Tequila. Edgar Wright movies always have that kind of like pacing to to them. He like has a, he has a specific style, the, yeah, and it's. That, <laughs>
Yeah. Like, he's kind of toned down that. That's sort of a early 2000s thing. The well, he knows how to do it where it's not just... <laughs> Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. He, he has a way of doing it where it's not just like style, though, where he's still telling the story yes, through yes. the montage stuff, right, which is good. Right. So he's, he, I can't fault him as a filmmaker, maybe no, a little bit God, as, a, no. as a screenwriter on this one. I think he wrote this by himself. Mm, so I, I don't think know. think so. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of people will like this, and it's uh, it's a it's an entertaining movie. An entertaining I, I don't I feel kind of bad. I don't want to shit on it too much, but it's we, this. we ain't shitting on it. We we are not shitting on this movie by any means, Jay. We're providing constructive criticism. But we have some criticisms, which means we hate it, and it's the worst movie ever. That's well, that's what the internet will tell us. <laughs> um, we both really like the film, but you know we we analyze. Yes. We analyze structure content, pacing, tone, dialogue, all the working, moving parts of a film, and we decide why they work and why they don't. And that's what we do, Jay, as VCR repairmen. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mike, would you recommend Baby Driver? Uh, of course I'd recommend Baby Driver. Um, as we said, it is not a remake, a sequel, or a reboot. It's a wholly original idea that feels like... Um, was this a Sony, a Sony release? Sony released this, yeah. Yeah. It, um, even though it was a Sony release, and that's another tie-in with our other film. There's, we'll there's a number of today. parallels, and they were both shot in uh, Georgia. Atlanta. Atlanta, yes. the, um, new, the new film capital of the world, apparently. Apparently. Um, but yeah, even though it was a Sony film, it, it felt like, uh, which I'm sure Sony just distributed it. They probably had nothing to do with the actual production, but it felt like Edgar Wright wanted to make this movie and he made it. And that's why it's like, eh, a little parts of sloppy. It kind of feels weird here, but he likes the stuff and it doesn't feel like the committee made it. Yes. And so on that alone, it gives it a recommendation because that's refreshing still um, as far as big movies in, that you see in the movie theater. Sure. You know, there are of course exceptions. But anyway, Jay, um, would you recommend Baby Driver? I would. I wish the love story was fleshed out a little more. That felt really rushed, but um, it's a lot of fun. See it in the loud theater. Cause all those car revving, all the engine stuff, the music blaring, it's a lot of fun. It sounds like you're recommending Fast and the Furious, you dolt. I like the part when Vin Diesel uh, jumped the ramp. Is he still in those movies? So, Jay, when's the wedding? Oh, we don't have a date set yet. We're still trying to figure out a location. Oh, well, if it's a location that you're looking for, might I suggest one of the hotels downtown? There's several options available. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. We're thinking someplace really nice, like Fiji or Greece, or maybe even under the Eiffel Tower. Mr. Plinkett says he loves me so much that he's willing to spend all of his life savings on this wedding, and even max out all of his credit cards. <laughs> we'll be paying off this wedding until we're both dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. Excuse me, but did I just overhear you two talking about the third Spider-Man reboot? What? No, who the fuck are you? Yeah, fuck off. Fuck off. What's up, guys? Wait a minute. You guys aren't the real Avengers. I can tell Hulk gives it away. Well, I think it's only fair that we ask Rich first what he thought of the movie. So, Rich, what did you think of The Amazing Spider-Man? Better luck next time? Oh, no. <laughs> the third time's the charm. That's what Sony would be saying if they wanted to remind the world about the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies, but those don't exist anymore. Neither does Tobey Maguire. And I'm not talking about his Spider-Man movies, I'm talking about Tobey Maguire. The very first Spider-Man movie ever is out now, 
It stars Tom Hollandaise as Peter Parker, who attends a high school with so much diversity college advertising pamphlets are jealous. Spider-Man must take down Michael Keaton, who is playing a character called the Vulture, from stealing alien technology and making weapons to sell to bad guys. That's the movie. Well, restaurant patron, what did you think of The Amazing Spider-Man Homecoming? I, ironically enough, it's amazing! <laughs> would you go so far as to say it's amazing? I would, yeah, I would go far, so far as to say it's amazing. Hmm. Well, I don't know you, but I'm gonna guess, just based on how you look, you are a big fan of the Spider-Man character. I haven't bought a comic book in over 10 years. But the, the, I, was, I was so fucking ambivalous about this film. Ambivalous? <laughs> Ambivalent. <laughs> okay, Mr. Webster, make it up your own words. Fuck you both! <laughs> I, I was so ambivalent about this film before it came out. It's, it's the, the, what, the ninth reboot? Yeah. How, it, it, the last one was only three years ago, and now it's a different Spider-Man. I just did not give a fuck. Sure. And it came out, and I watched it, and it's great. I, I feel like this is the first time I've actually watched Spider-Man on the big screen. Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask. I'm assuming that a lot of people that are into the comics or that like the Spider-Man character will probably say this is the best representation of him in by it. by a mile it's not my personal favorite i still have a soft spot for the by sam raimi movies miles this is this is the best on screen version of spider-man a, a, a kid who is bitten off more than he can chew and he's just barely staying afloat his his social life is being sacrificed constantly because he's got to put on the stupid costume and, and fight crooks. The crooks he's fighting, they're not trying to take over the world and destroy Manhattan. They're just they're selling guns. That, that was the, the best aspect of this movie is that the plot of it is Spider-Man has to stop a guy from stealing things. <laughs> And that's it. I said before, I think I said on the last, on the Amazing Spider-Man 1 or 2 review that, you know, Spider-Man's villains, they're not set up to be epic. They're, they're just guys who rob banks. And this is kind of what we have here. He's not robbing a bank, but he's, he's robbing expensive things. Yeah. He's just a thief. I think, I think I was just kind of like, just taken aback by how non, like how all the things that I would have expected from a Spider-Man movie and the general public like would have expected is is what Sam Raimi gave you, but like that's why you didn't really like those movies because it's not. That's not what the comic that's is. That's not what the comic is. So to me, it was like w w we did not, we never saw Spider-Man swinging around downtown Manhattan. He's there's that joke where he's out in the suburbs and he has to get somewhere really <laughs> oh, far away. Oh yeah, yeah. And so there's all those like those typical Spider-Man things that that are just not in this uh, movie. It's like they made a checklist of like things we've already seen too much of, mm -hmm. and they didn't put, like there's no back, no origin story, we don't have, because you and I were talking about that before the movie, uh, even though I just met you in this restaurant where uh, you were convinced they'd have at least some sort of quick little flashback. I, I was expecting a 10 to 15 second sepia toned <laughs> Uncle Ben death. And they don't even do that, they hint at it slightly. It now, now talking about it being faithful to the comics, that, that does kind of majorly affect something in this movie. Uh, Spider-Man's like two motivations to fight crime, guilt and responsibility. Yeah. That's gone. Mm. Everything else they nailed except for that. It doesn't ruin this movie. You know, what they they're doing some like Tony Stark father figure thing. His motivation in this film was to get approval from Tony Stark. But I'm sure not every Spider-Man story is fueled no. by guilt, which no. is what I liked about this, is that it really is just sort of, uh, like we talked about that with Deadpool, where it didn't feel like this epic, it was just like, here's a little story with Deadpool doing a thing. I think the script is, is very, very different and clever. Like you said, they- It kept surprising me, which, yeah. I, I was, you know, you go into these movies, especially now, I'm just expecting like mm -hmm. the same with these Marvel movies. Movies. Like some of them, I don't even count the Guardians of the Galaxy. That's its own thing. Yeah, is, is whoever John Watts was the yeah. writer, he uh, he he or whoever. Well, there's went... like six writers. Oh, so. okay. Well, whoever went through of the list of all the things we've seen before, yeah. because I'm sure they were worried about r fatigue with Spider-Man, or definitely don't do the origin story again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have a rather, a rather non-villainy kind of villain. Which was nice. He, I, uh, the first scene of the movie is like we always joke about, like the the mass destruction in all these movies, and then we're seeing like the local construction company cleaning up after the events of the first Avengers movie. 
And I thought that was great. And, and then and they get pushed out after they get screwed over by the government. Yeah. Yeah. Completely justifiable, justifiable motivations for our villain. The, the, there was a moment where the movie kind of turned for me, but then they brought it back. Um, Should we just get into spoilers, I guess? Oh, sure. All right. Spoilers! Yeah. So Spider-Man has a suit that was introduced in Civil War. Yeah. Um, and then, and that was a funny bit too, which I just forgot about until now, was <laughs> Spider-Man's home video of the his, Civil his War. His perspective of the Civil War fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was clever and different to haven't seen that. Um, uh, and then they discover, him and his sidekick friend discover that there's a training wheels program and they unlock it. And then it almost becomes like an Iron Man suit. That was where it was starting to lose me. Yes, and I'm like, oh no. You know, Spider-Man's fun because he's Spider-Man, not because he has like a robot talking in his head. Like, I, I don't a, like What is that. it, Jarvis in uh, Jarvis, Iron Man movies? He yeah. has his own. It, it, it works though, because the whole point is he's not ready to be on that. He's not ready to have the Iron Man suit yet. It works as a plot device. Yes. Yeah. At first, off-putting, because I didn't know it was going to be a plot device. Yeah. I thought, like, you get to take Spider-Man into the 21st century. Like, I thought, oh, God, this is a Sony movie. It's going <laughs> to go down hell. And then, you know, then they make light of it. They make jokes out of it. He doesn't know how to use it. Oh, my God. And then eventually it's taken away. Yeah. And then, then it's like, oh, great. That's perfect. Spider-Man has to beat the bad guy being just Spider-Man. Wearing his old crappy suit. Even his pre-Civil War suit. Yeah, it's the Teen Wolf premise. Um, <laughs> that classic Teen that, Wolf that film. classic Teen Wolf arc. Uh, I'm going to... We should point out for people, you're talking about Teen Wolf, the Michael J. Fox film, yes. not the MTV series. Right, yes. Because that's no one knows the Michael J. Fox movie anymore. Michael J. Fox... Uh, you're, not, you're not thinking about Teen Wolf 2 with Nobody's Jason thinking Bateman? about Teen Wolf 2. The, wait, the, Michael J. Fox is boxing. Teen Wolf 2 is basketball, right? Strike no, that, reverse, reverse it. it. Oh, shit. <laughs> Either way, the premise is Teen Wolf is good at a sport until the end when he decides he's going he's gonna to play that sport and win all on his own. Without being the Teen Wolf. Without being the Teen Wolf. And that's basically what happens in Spider-Man. Um, and then he learns to, to mature. But Tom Holland is, he's really good in it. I mean, I think we should really, really hammer home the humor. Yes. I mean, this is essentially this is, this a, is a comedy. It's a comedy. <laughs> I, I laughed out loud a number of times. I know you did. A little uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off reference in there, and running through the yards. Blatant. Well, they show it yeah. on the TV. Well, that was yeah. yeah. That was the thing is like like a, the second I thought this is exactly like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, they cut to someone's watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off on the TV. They know what they're doing. Well, if you're if you're doing a movie about a teenager who's coming of age, you could do worse than referencing a John Hughes movie. That's true. Yeah. Only he's not filthy rich. <laughs> John, John, John Hughes movies are always about teenagers who are filthy fucking rich growing yes. up, and they don't know it because John Hughes has no idea. Because John Hughes had a very sheltered life, apparently. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just an everyday teen growing up in this mansion. <laughs> Because I will kill you and everybody you love. The only person the vulture kills is on accident. I thought that person he killed was Tom Hardy. Through the entire first half of the movie, I thought, well, because I had heard Tom Hardy is cast as Venom, apparently, when they make a solo Venom movie. Oh, yeah? So I thought that was going to be like a little Easter egg. Yeah, The yeah. guy looked just like Tom Hardy. He was, he was the shocker. He was, is that, a, is that an actual comic book character? Okay. Were you shocked by that? <laughs> The Shocker, what an unfortunate name for a supervillain. Do you know why? Explain it. It's, I'm not gonna explain a sex, <laughs> a sex act on camera. Explain it. <laughs> uh, can we also talk about the, the anti-gay panic scene? Spider-Man climbs into his bedroom and, and jumps down and he takes off all his clothes into his boxer shorts and he forgot, forgot that his friend was coming over to help him put together a Lego set. And, and then... A Star Wars a Star Disney, Wars, Disney TM, TM Lego, set. Lego set. And then Aunt May comes in the room and, and, and he's standing there in his boxer shorts like right next to his, his friend and, and you expect Aunt May to go, 
what? And, 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 and the audience to laugh along. Isn't it funny they're, they're, they're doing a gay thing? But then Aunt May <laughs> just says, dinner's ready soon, guys. Finish jerking each other off later. <laughs> That was an actual line in the movie. I yeah. was surprised. And I was like, they didn't, they, how? They didn't go for the easy joke. They didn't go for the easy gay panic joke, which I thought was a little odd, because I think the, I, felt, I felt the audience like in the ready theater to... ready to laugh. Yeah. I felt it. It was, like, it was like palpable in the air. I felt it. I wasn't ready to laugh, but I was ready for the joke. Yeah, no, I was, yeah. it, was, it would have been like, eh, like Michael Bay, kind of like, eh, yeah. like really? Um, but yeah, it was, it was like, oh. They didn't do that. They, they clearly set it up. Did they do like a couple different takes? Like where she goes, whoa, whoa, whoa! They, they ended up using the Amy Pascal security take, actually. There's, there's probably 30 takes and they're going, what? <laughs> oh my God! No, Amy Pascal would, would, would have wanted the gay panic joke. Amy Pascal wrote racist things about Obama in those leaked emails. Oh, did she really? Really? Oh, she's, that's she's, interesting. I thought she was the progressive one. No, it's, it's virtue signaling. Actually, it, it would be vulture signaling. There's a ton of other subsystems in here, but they're all disabled by the training wheels protocol. I'm sick of Mr. Stark treating me like a kid. But you are a kid. The, the Ned character oh does not exist in the comics. At least, oh, no. At least not since the last time I've read. It's been 10 years, yeah. but yeah. It's fun, it's fun to give Peter Parker someone to talk to, though, about the Spider-Man stuff. I, I did like his, his little, like, early on, he talks about, uh, can I be your, your, your computer guy? Like, the guy that monitors everything, and then he kind of ends up doing that in the, the high school library. Uh, not only monitoring the uh, whereabouts of the vulture, but also trying to teach Peter how to drive a car. Yeah. Because he's stolen a car and he's never driven before and he can't even turn the headlights on. Well, like, well, that's fun. Did, did you notice the parallels going on between Spider-Man and the vulture with that? Because Spider-Man had uh, his friend being the, the computer guy with the radio. The vulture had that, that fat kind of tech guy giving oh, him sure. instructions. Yeah. Both, both characters are kind of like on the lower fringe of, of superhero ness, Spider Man wants to break into the big times, and the yeah. Vulture's resentful of the, the big wigs who've kept him down. Oh, yeah. They're the same. It's him. Yeah. They're the same. It's, a, it's an anti father figure. And they avoided the cliched line We're not so different, you and me. <laughs> you and I are not so different. Yeah, this, is, this, was, this was a strange, strange movie. <laughs> Where, for all the things that it didn't do. For all the things that it didn't do, yeah. yeah. Our superhero was bumbling and awkward and bad. Um, so it's not like, you know, like the Tobey Maguire movies were good, but they had a couple little scenes of him like learning how to use his power and then all, Standard, the next scene uh, he has a suit yeah. that looks like a professional movie suit when before he didn't, yeah. you know, and then it's sort of like, now he's Spider-Man, he can do anything, and, blah, blah, blah. and this, this Spider-Man never really gets to that point. Yeah. Um, so it's like... Because it's going to be an ongoing process, and it wasn't just, hey, he's good now. And that's good, that's good. And that's refreshing from an Avengers-y type movie or whatever, because they're all so, like, polished and professional and superhero-y. Uh, the, the stakes stay low. They, they don't waste a lot of time teasing sequels. Like, so-and-so yes. is going to show up that, That's something I wanted to mention is the, uh, the, the shared universe stuff, which is always the weakest part in any of these movies because it's like they feel so shoehorned in, like, because we have to set up this, this mo movie and that movie. And this one, like, it feels like a shared universe in the sense like, oh, there's Captain America on this, like, instructional tape. But it's not like distracting. It feels like a part of this world. It's not, it doesn't feel like the movie's setting other things up. I guess there's kind of that bit where they're talking about moving out of the old Avengers Tower, but that just feels like a story element. Well, it's in there to set up the heist at the end. Yeah, well, it's, 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 that's what I mean. It's in there for yeah. the story. I was also, I'm so used to, to like, bad screenwriting. When, <laughs> when uh, Michael Keaton, like, halfway through the movie, there was a scene with Michael Keaton and his henchmen, and I was thinking, like, you know, they're trying to kind of give him some humanity, and they mentioned early on his family. I was like, I'm surprised they haven't had a scene. Or, I'm not surprised, but they should have a scene, like, with his family to kind of, you know, give him that element. And then there's a reason that they didn't, and that pays off really well. Y'all see that twist coming? I yeah. did. That was the first time in ages I have been surprised by something yes. in the film. Right. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah. It was it up the stakes, it, it got made the storyline more complex. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, uh, this Spider-Man movie, uh, 
quite surprising that it was actually good. Because they actually did the character right for a change. What a shock! Well, I think I think with the uh, Sam Raimi ones, is it less that they did the character wrong and more you just didn't like the choice of actor? Wait. Okay, now talk. <laughs> no, because they never they never. The second one, that whole first half of that movie. The is... first half. The, the only time the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies felt like Spider-Man was. The first half of the first movie. I have a soft spot for the Sam Raimi ones just because I like Sam Raimi. And uh, the end credits of this movie are very like colorful and stylish. And there's a Ramon song playing, and it's like, um, like claymation and all these like animated sketches and stuff. I was like, this is really fun and stylish. And the rest of this movie doesn't really reflect that. It's very bland. This movie. Oh, the whole movie is very. About, like cinematography. Yeah, just or... visually, it's it's fine. But I, I miss that. I miss the Sam Raimi weirdness. I miss like awkward cutaways to overacting extras. It's Spider-Man. <laughs> I, I I don't need specifically that, but just visually, this movie, like a lot of the Marvel movies, even the better ones, are so just sort of like blah. Yeah, visually. I, I agree with that. The world's changing, boys. It's time we change too. My chance to prove myself. We have a Spanish quiz. You gotta get better at this part of the job. I don't understand. Yeah, Michael Keaton's character is a bad guy with some pretty well developed motivation. Kind of like uh, when Jamie Foxx played Electro. Oh, exactly <laughs> like that. <laughs> Where he became a, a bad guy that wanted to murder Spider Man because Spider Man didn't remember his birthday. Is that what happened in that movie? Well, what about the lizard man who wanted to turn people into lizards? <laughs> I think I think you're forgetting about the the, the, the lizard That's very in the important. Amazing yeah. Spider-Man one. That's some class A character development change. <laughs> I'm gonna. He was a lizard, so then he wanted to turn other people into lizards. Although, if I can make one comment about something I did not like in this new Spider-Man movie, I was watching the Black Panther trailer. They said the line, which I now hate. The world. <laughs> is changing. The world is changing. And then they say it in the Spider-Man movie. Michael <laughs> Keaton says it. He says, the world is changing. The world's changing. The world is changing. The world's changing. Can you stop using that phrase in your movies? Is changing. Did they say that in Civil War too? I'm sure well, they wait. do. That's yeah. why I bring it up because I'm sick of it. <laughs> when we make when we make Space Cop 2, that's gonna be in the trailer. The world is changing. I think you mean when you make Space Cop 2. Can we get Dr. Octopus in the next Spider-Man movie saying the world is already changed? <laughs> <laughs> The world is still changing. Now everyone wears tights and fights crime, <laughs> or commits crime, or fires blue lasers. <laughs> That's the world we live in now. It has changed. It has changed. It is no longer changing. <laughs> it has changed. The process of changing is over. It is complete. <laughs> it is now status quo. I don't have to do anything because the world has already changed. <laughs> <laughs> On that note of humor, Jay, would you recommend Spider-Man Homecoming? Uh, I would. It's it's a, a fun. It's funny. I think I'd recommend it as a comedy more than anything. And it's a good. It's a darn good superhero movie. It's too. a good Spider-Man movie. If you if you are, have not been satisfied with previous Spider-Man adaptations, this one seems to do it pretty well. Solid recommendation. I thought I thought I was gonna come out of this saying, yeah, it's the best cast Spider-Man we've ever had. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah. But instead, I'm saying. Well, it's the best cast Spider-Man we ever had, and it was great! <laughs> yeah, you know what? If I can just be honest, uh, Rich Evans not going, eh, is like, <laughs> like a <laughs> fucking glowing recommendation. <laughs> but yeah, most of the time it's meh. Yeah, most of the time. Most of the time it's meh. And uh, especially with something as specific as Spider-Man. Yeah. Um, that's, that's high fucking praise. It gets, it gets my stamp. Yes, um, and of course I, I agree and will agree with you guys. Uh, I thought it was terrible. <laughs> well, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get back to my wife. She, she doesn't appreciate, you know, talking about movies made for children all day long. 
She likes to talk about politics or world events or bill collectors. I, I keep trying to tell her that, you know, the third Spider-Man reboot's important. And she just, she just doesn't get it. And I guess that's why I go to see a head doctor twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. She likes to help me prioritize my life. Ugh. Oh shit, I gotta go take my medication. Yeah, my wife says it helps me think like a grown up. I'll talk to you two fuckwads later. Is that what all comic book fans are like? Yes. Well, I guess I should go check on Mr. Plinkett and see what's taking him so long in the bathroom. Yes, Jay. Why don't you go do that? I mean, I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. After all, he is the one bankrolling our very expensive wedding. Oh no, my plan is backfiring. The world is changing. I know what to do. Nothing.